I am Mark Orlandi, I am a research fellow at the Department of Cultural Heritage. And I'm also part of the staff of the Frame Lab, which is the photographic and multimedia laboratory of the Department of Cultural Heritage. The Frame Lab was officially established in 2015, even if as a group of researchers we've been working on digital heritage at least since 2013. The Frame Lab, directed by Professor Alessandro Iannucci, is composed by research fellows, PhD students, degree students and interns, all coming from human sciences. So we are all historians, archaeologists, art historians that has deepened through the years the knowledge of computer science. At the Frame Lab, we carry on different researches on visual technologies for the study, the analysis, and the dissemination of cultural heritage. One of our main activities is, of course, 3D modeling for cultural heritage, but we also deal with web archives, digital image editing, and digital restoration of historical photographs, GIS for historical analysis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here you can see some of the examples of web archives that we are working on in that moment. We have um, web archive for uh, um, the reception of Greek mythologies during the centuries for musical iconography or for, um, for example, for um, historical photographs of the First World War. Well, this is what we'll see in the next hour, hour and a half. In the first part, I'm going to show you the different steps uh, of the computer graphic work in general and what we use for our historical 3D reconstruction. So the methodologies and the softwares. The main steps uh, that are 3D modeling, 3D textures, and materials creation, lights, rendering, and a little bit of post-processing. Then I will show you some of our case studies, the methodology that we used, and the results and the outcomes that we achieved. And in the last part, I'd like to discuss a little about the perspectives of the 3D modeling for cultural heritage and of digital heritage more in general. The situation in our country, in Italy, but also at an international level, and the, ma the main problems that we have to face today when we deal with the 3D uh, applied to cultural heritage. But let's start with a broad overview about the 3D. Today we are surrounded by 3D in almost every aspect of our everyday life. We have 3D in cinema, we have 3D in video games, we have 3D in mobile applications, and even commercials have a lot of 3D contents with a such level of photorealism that it can be very hard to tell if an image is a 3D rendered image or an actual photograph. Consider, for example, that more than 75% of the images in the IKEA catalog, I presume that all of you uh, know IKEA, more than 75% of all the images in the IKEA catalog are not photographs, but are CGI renders. Why? Probably because it's much easier and maybe even cheaper than have a real photographic set with a lot of people involved build up and dismantle all the furniture for every scene. In this case, you what you need is just a couple of 3D models and a couple of PC. So we're literally surrounded by 3D contents, I was saying. But how are these contents made? Here, you can see a recap of all the, pos of the possible steps in the creation of a generic 3D content, whether if, if it's a movie clip, a single image, or anything else. You have a pre-production phase in which you get the idea, you create the storyboard, which is very, very useful to decide scenes and framing. Then you have the production phase here, which is the core of the pipeline. And you have a post-production phase in some cases. All these steps are not required if you're working on the creation of, three of 3D contents, but some of them represent the basic of a CGI work the 3D modeling phase, the texturing and materials creation, 
the lighting and the rendering with a little bit of post-processing. At the beginning of the widespread of CGI computer graphics in the late 90s and in the early 2000s, we had very few software applications that handled all the pipelines step you've seen before in the image before. Applications like 3D Studio Max or Maya or Blender, which is an open source 3D modeling software, um, had tools for 3D modeling or texturing or even uh, create some physics effects for visual effects, et cetera, et cetera. So with one software, you can handle all the pipeline processes. Today, the trend has changed a little and most of the times we have a pipeline that is broken into distinct software packages. The main reason is that since the late 90s, the hardware and the software for CGI have evolved a lot and the photorealism has dramatically improved, as you've seen, for example, in the IKEA catalog images that I've shown you before. So we do still have the all-in-one software solution like 3ds Max, Maya, or Blender, et cetera, et cetera, and they still can do everything quite well. But side by side, in the least 10 years, uh, more or less than 10 years, a lot of other software applications appeared, very specific for a single aspect of the 3D pipeline, and we'll see it in a minute. They do just one thing, but in an extremely precise and accurate way. Here you can see uh, some software packages um, grouped uh, by the um, a single step of the pipeline that I've shown you before. For example, here we are some softwares that do just uh, that do 3D modeling, for example, or here a group of software that can handle just the texturing phase, or just the real-time render, or the visual effects, uh, the post-processing effects, etc., etc. So, what's the result? The result is that today we can choose different software solution as needed, composing our own 3D recipe or better, our 3D pipeline. Our pipeline, the pipeline that we use when we generally um, have to, to do a, a 3D historical reconstruction, always starts with Blender. Blender is a 3D modeling software. It's an open source solution and it's totally free, but it's comparable to the more famous and expensive software such as 3ds Max or Maya. Generally, a 3D modeling software starts with a typical user interface, which is composed by one or more view, uh, one perspective, and one or more orthogonal, like a top view, a front view, a left view. Here we have the two typical um, 3D scene that you have when you open your 3D modeling software. So you have all you need, you have in, in the 3D scene, you have all you need. You, you have an object, you have a light source, and you have a camera that takes the, the, the rendering. This kind of architectural modeling is also called a box modeling because it always starts with a basic geometry, generally a cube, a plane, a sphere, or a cylinder. Then you can edit the geometry by moving, scaling, rotating, extruding uh, its main components, such as its edges, its points, or the faces. <coughs> and trying to recreate the shape you are looking to, uh, to model. Most of times you have reference images, uh, images, and if you have reference images, such as floor plans or section of what you're trying to recreate, you can import those images, you can scale them properly within the 3D modeling software, and you outline the shape from an orthographic view generally, such as a top view, and you can see in the uh, top left corner image here, you, we imported, this is part of uh, one of the projects that I'm going to show you uh, in, uh, in the next hour, and here we have the, the, mm, the floor plan of a church, we started outline the presbyterian presbyterial part here, the apse, then we added the section of the church and we started to extrude, uh, to edit our basic geometries, try to, trying to reproduce um, the old part of, uh, of the church. 
So this is more or less a very rough description of the box modeling uh, methodology that uh, is used most of the times for the 3D architectural modeling. And some architectural details like capitals or moldings can be very hard and time consuming to model um, using 3D modeling uh, such as the box modeling uh, technique. So we generally use a different approach based on a 3D survey rather than 3D modeling by hand. And this technique is called structure from motion, but it's also known as computer vision or image-based modeling. Structure from motion is quite simple. It's an image-based technique that generates 3D models starting from simple photographs. It's very similar to more sophisticated instruments like 3D scanners, for example. Uh, with 3D scanners, you can acquire the shape of an object by means of a, um, generally a laser strip or um, a structured light pattern that is projected to the surface of the object. It's deformed and it bounces back to, to the instrument. And um, you have, as a result, a very detailed and very precise 3D mesh and a very precise 3D object. Structure promotion is more or less similar, but uh, fortunately is much cheaper because uh, all you need to use is a camera, it's a digital camera, but also the, the camera of uh, your mobile phone would be, uh, would be uh, enough. You take several images all around uh, the, the object that you want to reproduce in 3D. Uh, these images must overlap for at least a 30% then you import uh, all of your images inside uh, uh, the, the, um, the software. We use uh, Agisoft PhotoScan, which is uh, very reliable and very affordable, and it's uh, used a lot also in archaeological applications. And once you have imported your, th uh, your images within PhotoScan, in um, uh, generally in an um, in, in, uh, amount of time of in an hour, more or less, it gives you back a 3D uh, object like this one. I try to, let me check if it works, no, okay. And it's very handy as a technique because uh, imagine if you have to model this from scratch, starting, starting from a cube. It's very hard, it's very time consuming and it depends also a lot uh, on the let's call it artistic skills of the 3D modeler or so of the operator in, the, in this case. Using structural promotion, um, you can have a, a very defined, a very precise uh, replica of your object of your, uh, of your artwork in this case. And once you have your 3D model, you can import the 3D model in your 3D modeling software and you can mix it with, um, with the 3D modeling that you, that, you've, mm, that you did before. These, for example, are images that we did inside uh, of the 3D survey that we did inside the church uh, to obtain the 3D model of this capital, for example. The next step is about textures and materials. Once you have created your 3D model, you have to define what it, it is composed of. To do that, you just have to set textures and materials. And think about textures and materials just like the dress of your 3D object. For example, if you modeled a 3D wall like this one, for example, You have to define whether this wall is made of bricks rather than covered in plaster or covered in wood or in ceramic tiles or any other materials. And the starting point is a texture. A texture is nothing but an image, a raster image or a photograph representing a material, a, the, representing better the color of the material. Once you've got your picture, you need to stick it to the 3D faces that compose your geometry, your 3D wall, for example, to obtain a wall that is colored like a real brick wall. But that's not enough. In fact, to achieve a photorealistic effect 
uh, we have to take into account more than just the color of an object. We have, in fact, to reproduce in CGI its physical properties. That means how a particular material behaves when it's hit by a light source. Some of that physical material, of that physical properties are, for example, reflections, opacity, roughness, or bumpiness, which is that grainy effects that you have, for example, if you touch a rough, um, uh, a rough surface. All this information can be stored in a texture, in different texture images, and these texture images, they don't have colors as main information, but they reproduce in grayscale the amount of different physical properties for any kind of material. For example, looking at, at these images, we have some softwares uh, some software um, like um, ones that you've seen before in, in, the, in, the, in the last slide. One of these software is called Substance Painter and Substance Bitmap to Material, and they do it this exactly. They take your um, original photograph and they can create from that image all the different images, all the different texture maps that carry different physical properties. For example, you can have the classical and the main RGB image textures, but you can also have textures that um, don't carry information about colors, but about reliefs, for example, uh, or about the metal, the roughness, uh, the, um, the shadowing of, of that particular material, et cetera, et cetera. So a material is more complex, is a more complex item rather than a single image texture. It's composed by many different textures blended together. And every texture image carries different kinds of information. The main one will be about the color, of course, while the others will carry information about the amount of opacity or reflection, as I said, the transparency, think about glasses, um, or the surface irregularities, the so-called bump maps. So texture mapping and materials are about image textures, but image textures are bidimensional, while we are talking about dressing a 3D model. So how can we wrap a 2D image to a 3D model? That's all about texturing about. To stick an image to a 3D model, we need to unwrap, to unfold the 3D model to a bidimensional surface. This process is called UV mapping, where U and V are the name of the axis of the image textures. That's uh, because X, Y, and Z are used to define the name of the 3D space axis. So uh, it, it was impossible to call this X and, X and Y because uh, it, it would have been a little bit confusing. So UV mapping process is based to the same principle of the process used in geography, for example, to create a planet sphere from the actual shape of the Earth. Every professional 3D modeling software has a tool to create UV maps unwrapping the 3D surface. After that, you can export the 2D UV maps as normal images, and you can edit them using an image editing software like, for example, Photoshop, the most used. And in Photoshop, you can paint details, um, you can overlay other image textures, you create and characterize your own materials um, easily. Once you, you are done, you just have to re-import the edited images in fo from Photoshop within the 3D modeling software and they will be automatically and properly rewrapped around the 3D object. So I start from the 3D object, I unwrap the uh, 3D faces to a bidimensional surface, I export this image to uh, Photoshop, for example, I mm, create my textures and my materials in Photoshop, and once that, I, that I'm done, I re-import the, the images inside the 3D model, and they are refolded and rewrapped around the object in a proper way. This, uh, if the UV mapping can be an easy operation in some cases, just for example, think about of this cube. 
the more complex and irregular is the surface of the 3D object, the harder will be the painting of the 2D UV maps in Photoshop, considering that the image will have a weird projection. Just take a look at this picture in the bottom right corner. Uh, of course, if, if you have to paint this kind of image in, in Photoshop, it can be uh, not so easy to do. So to ease this operation, we have today a particular type of 3D software that lets you paint directly in 3D. A software like this one, Substance Painter, is something like a mix of a 3D modeling software and an image edit software, like if we have Blender plus Photoshop. Once you have 3D model in uh, you have your 3D model in Blender, all you have to do is and you have of course you've created your UV maps. All you have to do is to export your model to import in Substance Painter and Painter has its own material library that you can use and you can also uh, create your own materials and it lets you paint directly on the 3D model with a huge saving of time. Uh, just let me, let me see if this is just a brief, a very short video about the possibilities that you have with a software like that. This is the 3D model that you can switch off the music. Uh, this is a, th a 3D model that you import inside uh, Substance Painter. You can move along, you can rotate, you can zoom in, zoom out. You can add your materials, and you can also paint directly on the mesh, adding, for example, very tiny details like, like grunge, like dirt on the edges, like uh, wear, uh, wear effects, etc., etc. And this is much more handy than export textures in Photoshop, work with textures bidimensionally, and then re-import the textures three-dimensionally. This is a quite new way to deal with textures in 3D modeling. And you have, of course, a very, very precise uh, effects like uh, particles. Uh, you can add granges or scratches all over your surface, etc., etc. So as you can see, it's, it's very, very, very easy to do. Next step, the next step, the third one, is about the lighting. Lighting a scene is strictly related to materials definitions, since we saw how materials are influenced by the light. At the beginning of the computer graphic application, at, at the beginning of the computer graphics, uh, our softwares try to fake the light's behavior in a 3D scene in many different ways. Since we didn't have the technical resources to reach a complete photorealistic result. Today, we have dedicated render engines that are physically accurate and they are able to reproduce the complex light effect caused by the infinite bouncing of ray lights in a scene. Uh, this is an image coming probably from the most famous um, render engine uh, on the scenario, which is called V-Ray. V-Ray is the, probably the most uh, used render engine by architects. It's a physically accurate, it's a, a standalone software, but it can be also uh, used in combination with the main uh, 3D modeling software and that's really physically accurate. The almost last step, the last step, the, the, the almost last step is the rendering part. Rendering is the process that bakes all the ingredients on your 3D scene to obtain a final result, a final image uh, that can be shared and viewed even outside the, your 3D software. You can have many kind of outputs. Generally, it can be 
a still rendered image, a movie clip, or a real-time rendered environments, just like in, uh, in the video game. The main problem with rendering is that it, it can be a very time-consuming operation. A render, is a, comp a render a complex 3D scene can take many, many, many hours to have just one rendered image. And that many times must be multiplied several times in case of movie clips. The amount of time needed to complete a render, it depends also uh, by the hardware configuration. Here you can see different uh, uh, images of software that we, software application that we use for uh, our different kind of outputs, our different kind of renderings. Um, this image is from Blender. Blender, of course, can uh, can uh, can do render can render images and also movie clips, uh, which are nothing but a lot of a lot of images um, that the, that you view very quickly. And here we have another. A uh, very useful software uh, that we we use a lot, which is called Lumion. This is a real-time architectural visualization software. Real-time means that it calculates all the rendering processes uh, in real time. So um, uh, what you see on the screen is what you get when you render an image or movie clips. In uh, when you use render engines instead of real-time uh, render engines, you have to wait hours, a lot of hours, to see your final result. Um, and the danger is that if there is something wrong in the rendering, some objects that um, doesn't touch the ground, so you have some errors in the shadowing, uh, and you can have a lot of errors, of course, when you have to deal with complex 3D scenes, a lot of objects, a lot of materials, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in this case, the danger is to wait many hours mm, or days to have your final result, and you find that you have to uh, restart from the beginning because of some errors. If you use some real-time rendering software, you can see immediately the result. Generally, um, real-time 3D rendering softwares cannot achieve the same photorealistic um, levels of 3D dedicated engines like V-Ray or Blender Cycles in this case. But, of course, uh, there's a lot of time saving here using this kind of softwares. And the last image on the um, bottom right corner uh, is about another kind of output that you can have uh, once you have your 3D scene. And it's uh, semi-immersive environment, it's a uh, 360 degrees immersive and semi-immersive environment. And today we see a lot of this. Uh, in this case, you have um, a, an, an environment in which you can move along almost freely. You can uh, move uh, from one point to another of, uh, of, uh, of the rooms that you're recreating in 3D. And uh, and it's very very useful, but it's somehow slightly different from the other two. But we will see in uh, in a minute. Okay, let's talk a little about uh, our case, some of our case studies. I would like to start with uh, the oldest one that dates back to 2013. It was about uh, a square of um, the city of Ravenna. This is a general view of, of Ravenna, which is not very far from, from here, of course. And it's the square of the Aryans. And the square of the Aryans, this is the city center of Ravenna. The square of the Aryans is over here. Consider that this is the very heart of the city. So. Uh, it's in the center part of, of, of Ravenna. This is, you have the train station, and these are more or less the boundaries of the center of, of, uh, of the city. The square of the Aryans in Ravenna preserves 
three significant monuments of the city, today perceived mostly as single pieces of built cultural heritage and such known and experienced by citizens and tourists. The Basilica of the Saint Spirit here, the so-called Wall of Troctus here in the middle, and the Baptistery of the Arians. These three buildings are largely, they uh, share the same history. The historical importance of the site of the square begins 15 centuries ago. After the so-called barbarian conquest of Italy and Ravenna by Odoacer in 476, Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, acquired control over the city in 493. The tradition credits Theodoric with the construction of the small basilica and of the eight-sided baptistry as part of the new religious area reserved to the Arian cult which was widespread among the Ostrogoths in opposition to the previous Orthodox area of Ravenna, built on the opposite side of the center. So at the time we have two main religious compounds in the city of Ravenna, the Orthodox one composed by the baptistry, the church and the bishop's palace, and the Arians one uh, with, its, with its baptistry, its church and its bishop palace. The major feature of Aryan Christian confession was a different conception of the Trinity. Christ was not considered as part of the same form of divine nature of God, and this had led to a long series of religious conflicts with the Orthodox Church. After the death of Theodoric, <coughs> deterioration in the relationships between Ravenna and the Eastern Roman Empire led Emperor Justinian to start a large war, which among the rest eventually allowed him to conquer Ravenna in 540. The Aryan building were converted to the Orthodox cult, and this marked the beginning of a 15 centuries long series of changes, whose major phases we tried to reconstruct through an analysis of literary sources, archeological data, modern surveys, present evidence and analogies with contemporary cases. For the original Aryan phase, we reconstructed three buildings, the church and the baptistry, still preserved, and the episcopium. All the three actually form one single large religious compound. On the basis of archaeological excavation, in our reconstruction, we lowered the soil to more or less two, two meters and a half below the present street level of the city of Ravenna. We removed the much later front portico of the cathedral that you can see in the picture here, and this is the reconstructed one, and we replaced it with an artex. The Aryan Bishop's Palace, it's an archaeological ghost because the area of the Bishop's Palace have never been excavated archaeologically. But its existence is suggested by comparable cases and by later literary tradition, which places it in the area of the Wall of Droctus, which we will discuss in a minute. We reconstructed on the basis of architectural comparisons uh, since we have no archaeological evidence, um, on the basis of ar architectural comparisons with the Episcopal Palace of Porek in Croatia. Archaeology proves the existence uh, also of a seven-sided ring access corridor to the much taller than now baptistry. You can see the, in the image of the today's state of the baptistry, we don't have any uh, corridor, and here we have from archaeological evidence uh, evidences we reconstructed the, the, the corridor. And various contemporary architectural comparisons suggested also the likely existence of a square column portico, possibly linking all these monuments, this portico here that linked the baptistry to the bishop's palace and, uh, and the church. We reconstructed thinking to the area as a one whole compound. 
For the subsequent orthodox space, no particular information is preserved. There were possibly no significant architectural modifications, although all monuments were rearranged to different uses. Ninth, se ninth century literary tradition claims a converted Lombard chief called Droctus, who had decided to side with Ravenna against his own people, used to live in the rooms once belonging to the Arian bishop. Droctus, uh, any, anyway, is a half legendary character set in the late sixth century who became a sort of acquired hero of Ravenna. Almost nothing is known of this alleged house, but a long erudite literary tradition identifies what is today called Wall of Troctus with its remains. We have no how idea how the former bishop's palace could have looked at this time, and the wall you can see now is no doubt later. The church was rededicated to St. Theodore, and the baptistry became a small church called St. Mary in Cosmodon. Nothing is known as well about the square portico. Its demolition probably started quite soon. The third long phase dates back between the 9th and the 15th century, during which the area is entrusted to the order of St. Benedict. The church gains internal decoration and a front portico. This one. And is rededicated for the third time as a basilica of the Holy Spirit at the end of the 15th century. The oldest phase of the so called Wall of Troctus, corresponding to the lower part of the present day wall, was probably built in the 9th or 10th century as one of the walls of the Benedictine monastery, which surely was installed in the area, and which, judging from later evidence, possibly had its cloister here. In this phase, the whole portico of the square was certainly completely removed, as there are traces of most cemetery built in the square, close to the wall and the baptistry, which possibly losing loses its ring corridor at this point. This is the whole image of the, of the area between the 9th and the 15th century with the Benedictine uh, cloisters here. In the 16th century, the floor of both the baptistry and the basilica and those of, of the whole square is raised 19 centimeters in order to match the contemporary soil level of Ravenna. Um, habits from the Grassi family from Bologna take over the administration of the area and commission major restorations and modifications. The narthex of the church is completely rebuilt as an oversized still existing portico. This is the one that you see now if you visit the square of the Arians. The wall of Drogtooth, probably a very simple cloister wall, connected the new portico to the baptistry. The ring corridor of the baptistry itself is demolished along with the three of the four apses of the building, you can see here. And a small portico is added on the northeast entrance, just the east, the east apses preserved. The other, the remaining apses are demolished and a, a, a little portico is added on the northeast end entrance. And this is the uh, overview of the whole area in, in that period. Between 1608 and 1795, the area is assigned to 13 clerics and once again is largely modified. The baptistry was dramatically modified. Its east side was opened and a new large structure built, partially encompassing the old baptistry, which now acted as the apse of the new building. An oratory, this one, with the new building attached 
to the previous structure of the um, of the baptistry with this portico um, an oratory destined to a local group of nobles called the Brotherhood of the Cross. As you can see here, the baptistry were, was barely recognizable at this point. Between the end of 18th century and the beginning of the 20th century, a, pre a period of decay begins. The Theatines leave the city at the end of 18th century and all the buildings except the church are sold to private individuals. The church is kept in a very poor state. The former monastery becomes a luxury hotel, and still today traces of the rooms built against the south side of the Drogtuf's wall are visible. The baptistry and the oratory are desecrated and sold to privates. Now quickly to the 20th century. The owners of the hotel, let me go back to. to here. Mm. The owners of the hotel are forced to restore the wall of Droptuf, but at the same time they are allowed to open a portal for vehicles through it. The Italian state purchases the baptistry and restores it to uh, some kind an original aspect, although without acquiring the former oratory. A lucky series, lucky, uh, so-called lucky series of allied bombings during World War II destroys the former monasteries, now hotel, the former oratory and the other uh, modern buildings which had been attached to the monuments, somewhat setting them free after centuries. Unfortunately, the area, already heavily subjected to urban, uh, urban degrade, is ignored by local authorities, destined to uh, garbage collections and wild parking while the monuments are neglected proper cultural and social recognition. Despite the baptistry enlistment among other early Christian monuments of Ravenna in the UNESCO World Heritage List in 1996. The following was the situation we approached when we decided to dedicate our research to the Square of the Irons. Murals, Heavy social degrade. You can see the situation in the beginning. And lack of maintenance. Undisciplined parking of vehicles just next to the monuments. Superficial and post war concrete restoration. Weird mixture of public and private properties, uh, preventing the full access to all of three monuments unlawful garbage disposal, as you can see here, just around the baptistry, neglect of surveillance, the cross at the top of the baptistry has been stolen in the mid-90s, and difficult access to the monuments, which are not properly signaled. So the aim was to study in depth bringing together history, archaeology, art history, architecture, engineering, chemistry, physics, and computer graphics. Along the collection and study of relevant literary and material sources, we, cons we conducted an analysis of decay phenomena. This led to a theoretical reconstruction of various phases, as you saw before, and eventually to a virtual reconstruction of these phases. A major achievement was that the virtual reconstruction acted in turn as a, as a verification of the same theoretical reconstruction as it allowed every contributing scholar to assess his theories in comparison to those of the others. This form of research has been able to make the results of the study accessible to a wide audience. We decided to turn such results into a multimedia exhibition event which took 
which took place in July 1620, 2013, in the square of the Aryans itself. The exhibition employed different communication means, traditional panels, video and audio, uh, QR codes linking to multimedia contents, equi-rectangular visual reconstructions of selected historical phases inside cylindrical totems. Uh, you can see a picture, a mm, tiny picture over here. Um, through a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach, the project achieved remarkable results in terms of communication and feedback. The methodology employed allowed to arrange an evaluation scheme of our 3D models based on different colors, according to different levels of reliability, depending on whether they were based on material evidence, inferred from historical documentation, uh, or on analogy. Furthermore, the exhibition allowed to show a new way to access enjoyment and social understanding of the monuments. You can see some of the pictures coming from the uh, exhibition and uh, that took place directly on the, on the square itself. And this was our very first um, 3D historical reconstruction uh, Example. Okay. Hmm. Let's see another one. 2014, uh, the Church of Saint John the Evangelist in always in Ravenna. Um, first of all, the position. So Saint John the Evangelist. Um, is one of the most ancient church of Ravenna. It's not very far from the baptistry of the Arians, from the square of the Arians that you've seen before. Uh, here is the square of the Arians, here is the position of Saint John the Evangelist. And unfortunately is all even nearer to the train station and we'll see the reason uh, in a minute. Its foundation dates back approximately to uh, 5th century, and it was commissioned by Empress Galla Placidia after the miraculous survival of a shipwreck coming back from Constantinople. The research project of, uh, for St. John the Evangelist aimed, similar to Ariani in Piazza, uh, to reconstruct and foster the knowledge about the 15th century history of the church by means of multimedia technologies such as 3D models, a website, digital historical images, audio files, and so on. Starting from historical documents, we were able to repropose 12 significant moments in the life of St. John the Evangelist, the initial five of which were reconstructed virtually through the use of computer graphics. The methodology used for 3D modeling followed the same principle as the former project, we used Blender for all the 3D reconstruction process, from modeling to texturing and rendering in this case. Moreover, we reconstructed virtually uh, only the phases with, of course, a reasonable, a reasonable amount of information, trying to present different theories for the most problematic situations. Here, for example, you can see, I don't know if it's we can see better in a later um, uh, slide. Um, but here is a, an example of the representation of a huge mosaic that uh, used to be in the apps. The original mosaic had been lost over the centuries. We knew just the subject, but we had no iconographic information. So we knew the subject uh, from literary uh, sources. We decided to attempt a proposal of a reconstruction based on similar artworks uh, conserved in other churches, not to render the original aspect, which is impossible since we had no traces of the iconography of that mosaic, but to give a user just the idea of how it would have looked like uh, if uh, you entered the church in, in that period. For the most important phases, we created also virtual tools 
Each virtual tour is enriched by some points of interest that lead users to detailed information about specific parts of the church, such as the apps, the mosaics, the ground level, etc., etc. Moreover, virtual tours can be very useful if viewed on mobile devices like tablets. In fact, they can interact with the gyroscope, especially on Apple devices, but also on, uh, um, uh, on, on, on other devices. So every time a user moves or rotates um, the devices, the view within the tablets rotates accordingly. Uh, so let me show a little how we um, set up the uh, results for the St. John the Evangelist. Here we, we set up um, something like a website. It's a CMS, a content management system. In, uh, and we uploaded, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the translation is still a work in progress, so it's for the, at the, for the moment it's just in Italian. And we uploaded all the content on, on the website and using a timeline effect. Here you can pass from the very first phases of the church until the last one, for example, one of the most uh, interesting because we have uh, wonderful historical images is the World War II bombing. As I told you before, the church is very, very near to the train station and of course uh, the train station have been heavily bombed during uh, 1944. And so the church um, has been s some kind of uh, collateral damage, we can say. So it's, it was complete, almost completely destructed and reconstructed after the Second World War. And the church, is, the church has changed a lot. And we can see even in, uh, in the first part, we have, for example, the foundation we have some basic info and we can uh, access a more detailed um, information page uh, in which we have um, many different kind of outputs. We have some uh, still rendered image made with Lumion. Uh, as I told you before, it is very useful because it's very quick when you have to render images and movies. Um, some description. This, okay, here you can see um, a little better the reproposition of the <coughs> mosaic of the apps. Here we we um, created also some short movie clips and we created also, oh no, flash player. Okay, this is the old version which is based on uh, uh, flash player. Here we have the uh, virtual tour of the f of the foundation phase, so um, you can move along the the, uh, the church. You have these uh, little maps that tells you where you look at. So if I turn around, even the radar turns accordingly, we can move to other points inside of the church. So it's not like a video game because I cannot run wherever I want, but I can move between different points, uh, viewing points. And we can have also information about um, the history of the church or some particular aspect of the church. For example, this one. Um, as I showed you before, with the Square of the Irons project, um, sometimes, we, n every time, we use 3D modeling also to test hypotheses. In particular, for St. John the Evangelist, there is a, a huge archaeological question about the aspect of the apse at the beginning um, of, the, of its history. Uh, if, if you visit today the church, you will find two different orders of windows. One is closed and one is open. And um, probably uh, one, one of the orders of the windows has been closed um, very few years after, after the foundation of the church. But uh, archaeologists are still um, arguing and discussing about uh, what 
the, what was the original aspect of the church. So we decided, by means of the 3D modeling, to uh, reproduce both of the hypotheses and to, see, to, to give a visual representation. And many times it can be a great help to test different hypotheses. So you can move along, etc., etc. And we did uh, reconstruction also for <coughs> other uh, phases. We can just have a look of another one. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting is probably this one: um, the medieval phase of Saint John the Evangelist. Oh no, here. That's. Uh, an interesting phase because uh, between 11 and 13th century the church is decorated with a lot of uh, ground floor mosaics um, most of them uh, has been lost during the centuries but if you enter the church now you can see uh, some of them the survived ones hanging on the walls so we decided to try to attempt a recollocation of these mosaics on the floor, on their original positions. So if you take a look, of course, at the, at the movie clips, but if you always, if you enter the church of the 13th century, you have, of course, you can move along uh, of the church, but you have also information about the iconography um, related to each uh, piece of uh, of mosaic and the virtual tour we will uh, return on that in, in the next project but it's very useful in this case for a couple of reasons first it's it can be um, almost completely web based so once you have created your virtual tour you upload it on the web and you can access with your PC, with your mobile device, and you don't have to install anything on your PC. So it's very easy to use. And another very uh, unique feature is that if you take a look uh, at a, a virtual tour with your um, mobile device, for example, a, ta a tablet or a, or a smartphone, um, once you rotate uh, your device, your view um, rotates accordingly. So when we, at the end of the, um, at, uh, at, the uh, at the project, we had we, we did an exhibition uh, inside the church, and people who had tablets can have a direct comparison between the nowadays situation of the church and uh, and one of the reconstructed phases of the church. So you can have the same point of view and two different. Um, phases of the church, one uh, viewed by the eyes and the other one viewed by the, your mobile device. So it, it, it can be very, very handy. Okay. Next one. The next one is uh, the it was it, it was born like a sort of a test, and uh, we are trying to update this project in the in the next uh, in the next year. That's the digital reconstruction. It's it's not 100% reconstruction um, of the mm, Studiolo, which is in the Urbino Duke's Palace. Uh, the Studiolo is the mm, most private. Uh, room in the Federico da Montefeltro Duke's Palace in Urbino. It was the private room of the Renaissance Prince. And uh, the urban studiolo in Urbino, it's a very tiny room, uh, considered it's about uh, three, three for three for five meters probably. And, but it's uh, very richly decorated. As you can see in uh, these pictures here, you have in the studiolo two orders of decoration. In the lower order, you have uh, lots of wooden inlays, wonderful wooden inlays. And in the, um, in the lower uh, order, you have um, 
16 uh, um, paintings of the so-called illustrious men, which are paintings of uh, Greek uh, uh, philosophers, Latin poets, uh, Christian saints, and all, uh, everyone who had a role in the education of the prince. So it's a very tiny but very uh, full of contents room. Um, here probably it's, yeah, yeah, you can see even from, from the projector, some of the illustrious men um, paintings are in black and white. That's because the, um, the collection has been dismantled or has been dismembered over the years. So the, the black and white uh, paintings are some of them in Germany, some others in, uh, in England, some other in the uh, United States, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And for the rest, the, the m we didn't, uh, d yes, we didn't have a, a virtual reconstruction, a digital reconstruction, because 90% uh, of the studiolo is uh, still in place. But we created a virtual tool starting uh, from the, the, as usual, from um, reference images, so from uh, um, sections, uh, ground plans, et cetera, et cetera. We use Blender to import all these reference images. We scale them uh, properly inside the, the software and we started the 3D modeling and the 3D texturing of all the, the Studiolo. One of the most difficult part was the, the ceiling, of course, because it's very richly decorated. And in this case, we use um, an artifact. So we use uh, an image textures technique. Use um, we use bump maps. So we uh, represented. Uh, we started from the, the the image of the ceiling. Then we created. A an image textures with just information about the relief, and we mixed it uh, with the color information to fake uh, the modeling of the ceiling. So it wasn't actual, uh, actually 3D model, but it was textured uh, in a very realistic way. Then we created uh, the virtual tour from Blender. As I told you before, uh, the virtual tour uh, creates 360 degrees environment starting from photographs. You must have a lot of photographs, a lot of images of your room. Um, again, they must overlap for a certain amount of percentage. <coughs> and once you have all these images, you can import them in a, in a particular kind of software. We use a French software that is called Color Panoply Pro. And the software creates a particular perspective image, this kind of image. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of image with a, a very strange perspective. It's called an equirectangular image. It's not very useful uh, in this way, but once you uh, fold that um, using a cylindrical uh, projection, you recreate the 3D um, 360 environment. And in color, uh, you have the chance also to add um, some hot spots and some uh, uh, points that can lead you to um, multimedia content. You can uh, lead you to an external web page, to an image, to a movie clips, uh, to mm, a lot of multimedia. <coughs> <coughs> contents, sorry. I'd like to show you all even the, the tour of um, Urbino. Okay? Because in this case, uh, we, we didn't reconstruct something that it's not in place, something that has been destroyed or heavily modified during the century. We reconstructed something that uh, it's still there, but with another purpose, to add uh, contents to um, a, a particular room which is full of um, information. 
in particular, sorry. What happened? It's stuck. That's what happened. I've broken the PC. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so we reconstructed the digital uh, copy of the of the uh, Studiolo to add particular kind of contents. For example, in the wooden inlays, we have um a lot of things that a user can experience for example in this case we have some uh, music uh, directly um, inscripted in the wood and that and another one is the only um, written copy of this kind of music so it's possible also <laughs> Also to add musical contents <coughs> and this is the reproduction of the music written directly in the world so the virtual tour is very useful because you can add different kinds of uh, um, of media videos and even for in this case we have this particular piece of music with which is only in the Urbino Studiolo. It's not written in any other literary sources. And even in this case we have the musical reproduction. We also added an, uh, another impossible point of view just to let a user take a closer look to the upper register. A glimpse to the future. In 2018, we will uh, we'll do something very similar for the uh, Studiolo in Gubbio which is um, very similar to the, the studio of Urbino. It was um, began by Federico da Montefeltro and it was ended by its son Guidobaldi. In this case, um, if you go to the Duke's Palace in Gubbio, you can still see the, the wooden inlays uh, in the lower register, this is Gubbio, but uh, the, the, the the decorations that you see in the Studiolo in Gubbio is, it's n they're not the original one. The original one are in the Metropolitan Museum uh, in New York. The one you see in Gubbio, it's just a replica. Um, uh, so we're, um, we will uh, acquire digitally the original ones and we, uh, we will create something very similar for the, uh, the Gubbio's Palace. The last one that I want to show you is the more recent one. We come back to Ravenna in this case. And this is the <coughs> church of uh, another church. And this is the church of um, Santa Maria in Porto Fuori. It's not within Ravenna, it's just a few kilometers outside Ravenna. Uh, this is a very particular church. Um, this is a very old church. Its foundation dates back to the uh, 11th century. And it was very important because in the 14th century, it was decorated with a, um, a cycles of fresco, um, probably made by, one, by Pietro Darini, that was one of the scholars of Giotto. That was one of the most important example of Riminese 
uh, paintings, uh, paintings from the Rimineso school um, in the um, area uh, around Ravenna. Unfortunately, during the um, Second World War, in uh, the 5th of November 1944, uh, the church was completely destroyed by uh, bombing from uh, um, United States Air Force. And that's the result of the bombing. Nothing survived, no people, uh, and of course, not the, the mosaics that uh, has been complete, completely destroyed. The church is still in place. If you go to Porto Fuori, uh, you can see the church, but as you can see in this picture, it has been rebuilt in a very different shape. Uh, today it has a very 1960s look. So it's very different, it's no more like the, the, the old one. So uh, the mosaics, I told you that they, um, they've been completely destroyed by the bombing. All that we have left are some historical images um, before the bombing. So we started from that, from of course historical uh, ground plans of the church um, in, the, in its shape before the bombing, trying to reconstruct <coughs> the church and trying to recollocate um, the, 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 um, the historical uh, photographs and the painting. Um, the methodology is, as usual, uh, starts with Blender, uh, we imported the, the, um, the reference images and we uh, started to create the 3D shape of the church. We used also structural from motion techniques for some of the most complex parts of the church. We used Lumion to create the, the 3D render at the end, but the, the, the most difficult part in this case was not related to the 3D modeling, which in this case was more or less straightforward, but was related to the texturing part because we had very different images. Uh, very different because uh, some of them are very yellowish, some others were very dark. Uh, some of them um, uh, represented all the knife of the church, some others just an a very tiny element like the face of one saint, for example. So trying to um, reproduce all these images uh, within a single 3D space, it was a very hard and time-consuming operation. And we did it, of course, in cooperation with uh, art historians uh, within our department. We decided also to left, uh, you can see some, some results, and we decided also to left the, the reconstruction in black and white because all the photographs that we have are in black and white. And uh, we have very few information about the colors, not enough to attempt a, recolor a, a recoloring uh, of, the, of the frescoes, of course. Uh, we produced uh, 3D movie clips for the church, we produced a virtual tour and some rendering images. Uh, I would like to show you an example of here. You can skip the music. It's happening. <coughs> These are. Um, this is a little movie that we created, uh, starting from the three D reconstruction of the church. Uh, passing to Lumion and uh, with uh, all the texture images applied. Uh, this reconstruction recently, uh, we tested this reconstruction as a virtual tool recently also uh, with uh, virtual reality headset like the one we I have with me. And so I'd like to, uh, if you want to try, I'd be glad to have your feedback too about a, a very immersive experience. This is a very 
one of the most difficult parts in this case were also trying to acquire to the, the, the images at the highest resolution possible and try to match them to create a sort of uh, photo mosaic, a huge photo mosaic of all the images and all the textures related to that part of the, of the, um, of the church, that part of the uh, apse, uh, that particular uh, saint, etc., etc. So, to conclude, mm, in these last slides, I would like to uh, share with you a couple of thoughts and some problems about 3D historical reconstructions. You've seen that CGI represents a very useful and powerful tool for historical and archaeological research. Technology becomes more and more and more user-friendly every day and researchers with a human even with a humanistic background like me can easily learn and use the software for 3d modeling or 3d survey so we use the same tools that are used in entertainment and in game industry and the final product is also more or less similar so what's the difference between this and that this is a, an image coming from St. John the Evangelist project, of course, and this is an image coming from a very, very famous video game, which is called Assassin's Creed. Probably um, some of you uh, know this, uh, this video game. Uh, for this particular video game, um, the entire city of Florence in 14th century has been reconstructed for the game. So we have a sort of historical reconstruction even in this case. What are the difference between that image and that image? The first of all, uh, obviously, is many million dollars. Uh, we will come back to this later. Uh, the message that these two images convey is the same, not indeed. CGI can be used in both situations. The results can be also similar, but purposes and aims are completely different. And that is uh, a, a thing that we must highlight. Otherwise, a wrong message will be conveyed to non-professional users. And the message is that games and historical reconstruction are the same thing. Because they are created with the same software, we, we share a lot of the same methodologies, and uh, we have some kind of uh, very similar outputs. But the difference can be that historical reconstruction are less pleasant, because of course we don't have all the resources that they have, and they are boring. That's the main danger, in my opinion. I was talking about many million dollars, I was joking, but n not at all, probably. Um, just a couple of numbers in this case. Uh, the game that you've seen before, Assassin's Creed 2, uh, has a budget uh, around 18 millions of euro. One of the highest budgets in the video games industry is that of Grand Theft Auto V, another video game, and not so recent, uh, dating back 2013 which reached the impressive amount of 170 million of pounds, which are over 200 millions of euro, just to create, develop, and, and distribute this video game. For comparison, 
the total amount budgeted for the period 2013 and 2015 by the Italian ministers for cultural heritage and tourism for the research and innovation in cultural heritage is about 47 million of euros. So uh, we cannot compete with these numbers. But the problem, and I return to the, to the main question, is that we, uh, luckily, we have the same uh, tools to, uh, to create 3D historical reconstructions. But the problem is that the message uh, can be uh, the same, while the message isn't the same. We have to highlight that the purpose is that um, the purposes from a, a 3D historical reconstruction is very different, is not related to entertainment. So it's very different from something that visually can be very similar. Two important documents has been produced by the academic world about these topics. The London Charter for the Computer-Based Visualization of Cultural Heritage and the Principle of Seville, International Principles of Virtual Archaeology. Both of them, and I quote, seek to establish principles for the use of computer-based visualization methods and outcomes in the research and communication of cultural heritage in order to promote intellectual and technical rigor in digital heritage vis visualizations and ensure that computer-based visualization processes and outcomes can be properly understood, I repeat, properly understood and evaluated by users, just to mention a couple of, of the principles. London, Chargers, the London Charter has been established in 2006 by a group of researchers coming from all over Europe. Uh, the, 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 the name, uh, the complete name, was renamed after a year, so the, uh, its real name is London Charter for the Computer-Based Visualization of Cultural Heritage. And for example, a couple of principles, um, principle three for the research sources says that in order to ensure the intellectual integrity of computer-based visualization, intellectual integrity that we must have. Relevant research sources should be identified and evaluated in a structured and documented way. And principle four, uh, even more in depth about the documentation, uh, states that sufficient information should be, should be documented and disseminated, documented and disseminated, to allow computer-based visualization methods and outcomes to be understood and evaluated in relation to the context and purposes for which they are deployed. We have to uh, state our uh, sources and uh, our um, outcomes. Same for the principle of Seville, um, that is a, a little more recent, so it, it's from 2011. And uh, in, in the preamble, they say the worldwide application of computer-based visualization in the field of archaeological heritage may be described as full of lights and shadows. The spectacular growth of cultural tourism and amazing technological advances in recent years have led to the development and implementation of a myriad of projects uh, to investigate, preserve, interpret, and present various elements of archaeological heritage using computer-based visualization. A myriad of, of projects, uh, not, a whole the sa not all of these projects share the same uh, serious methodology. That's why the London Charter and the Principle of Seville, um, that's why we have today the London Charter and the Principle of Seville. So it's uh, um, um, a very important uh, theme in the inter at, uh, at an international level, and this will be one of the um, next challenges uh, in the next years. Try to um, create and try to follow um, very uh, rigorous um, principles about how a 3D historical reconstruction should be and how it should be uh, different from a, a product that 
that can be very, very similar um, visually, but it's um, created with very different purposes. Okay. Thank you very much. If you want to, I'd uh, be glad to um, set the, the VR headset to try the, the immersive view of the Church of Santa Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much.